Welcome to the Look Good, Move Well podcast. Okay. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Thanks for being with us. Welcome back. We're going on three, third episode, uh, third, third back-to-back episode where we're sourcing our topics and our questions from all of you out there, listeners, uh, Instagram followers. So thank you for submitting questions to the AMA. Keep a lookout for AMAs that show up on social media, on Instagram. Great place to ask questions that we can either answer there or here on the podcast. Yeah. And um, one of the people who watched a podcast episode on YouTube that happened to be the third one that we recorded that day, because we've been recording three in a row, they complained because we didn't have enough chit chat at the beginning. They were like, what? No chit chat? (laughs) Chit chat. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we've we've burned through quite a bit of chit chat. (laughs) But... um, I don't know. Give me a little chit chat. What do you got? Satya? Okay, I, I got some. So, all right. One of my favorite things to do is go <laughs> on Reddit. I'm a big Reddit nerd, and I love Jim Story Saturday, which is oh. a whole thread that happens weekly where everyone tells their like hilarious gym stories and all of the things about the people squatting or curling in the squat rack. You know, the typical gym stuff. What's your gym story of the week? Okay. Well, one thing that came up from this thread that made me want to ask you is oh yeah like you know how when you go to a globo gym it's anonymous like in a crossfit class everyone knows each other in our gym people know each other but in yeah yeah people don't know each other's names and so you kind of come up with the name of the person in your mind (laughs) like the instagram workout girl and uh, okay okay so what would your anonymous gym name be oh um i guess it would depend on what kind of workouts i was doing Mm -hmm. at at the gym um I think probably like at different phases, I've had different, different, different gym personas. I was definitely like <laughs> the guy, the guy at the Globo gym who's like trying to do CrossFit at the Globo gym. <laughs> like the last time I was really hitting the Globo gym hard, like, you know, doing Murph, like on the treadmill. And, um, so I could have had a name there. Um, but I was, I was definitely probably like, most people were probably just like, I don't know. I didn't fit in at the gym because I was just working way too hard. Yeah, and yeah. I was too focused and I was too regimented. They're like, the hell is going on with that guy? Like, he shouldn't be here. But yeah, I'm, what would your name be? Yeah, something along those lines, like way too serious girl. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, crack a smile for Christ's sake. I know. I'm like super intense. <laughs> funny, funny that you bring this up. There was um, when I was in high school going to Gold's Gym here in Marin, there was a, there was a woman that was there who was like, we called her like abs. Cause yeah. she just had like this crazy, like chiseled ab set. And she <laughs> was, she did abs a lot. She did a lot of hanging elbows in the straps, mm. knee tucks. Um, f- oddly enough, years later came to know her very well. Cause she became part of the CrossFit circle I was in. <laughs> and I remember the day it clicked. I was like, <gasps> You're a ab 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 lady. <laughs> you know, you're an ab girl. Like it's crazy. So, Did you tell her? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, she was she 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 was happy to to know that. Yeah. You know, she great. She was proud of him. She maybe been. I'd be ab lady. I don't know. Probably would be actually. <laughs> okay. That's a that's a little. She thought so to just slip that one in there, like but BT dubs. I got a, I got a nice <laughs> set of abs. If you didn't know already, if you didn't know already, I don't take my shirt off as much as Marcus, but you know, I got a nice set of abs. Part of the job here. I don't know. It's just you know. It's a All thing. right. Okay. Is now we're ready. Chit chat. We did. Yeah, it? we're ready for nail the chit chat. <laughs> okay. All right. So, a couple questions about our uh, upcoming pillars program. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I thought we could get into these. And, you know, if you're not interested in trying our Persist program, which, I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't be, but I think that there is a lot to take away from this conversation, hopefully, around how we think about training, putting together training programs, movement splits, that kind of thing. So, yeah. On that How do you note, write programs, programming yeah. methodology, concepts? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, let's get into it. All right. So, what will the training day schedule be for the new Pillars track? Okay. Well, there's, uh, it's written as a four day a week training program. They happen to fall on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, but you can really do it any days that you want. I think the idea is that there's two blocks. There's two, two day blocks. There's an upper body and a lower body Monday, Tuesday, upper body, lower body, Thursday, Friday. So 
you'd, you'd likely want to separate those by a day. If you're training four days a week, you know, maybe you have a rest day on Thursday and Sunday, you know, you could mix and match in, in different ways. Um, the training days are, you know, worked pr really hard to try and think about the average uh, client that we would have coming in, what their knowledge base is, how familiar they are in the gym, and that person it should it should take sixty minutes or less to do. If you're if you're very new to training and you have to maybe spend a little bit more time looking at some exercise demonstration videos or reading a little bit more, it might take a little bit longer than that. But certainly the goal is to not you know we, we want you in and out of the gym, warmed up, trained, cooled down on your way in 60 minutes. And for me or somebody who has a lot of experience and who can, you know, move f fluidly through the gym, it might take 45 minutes or 50 minutes only. And that's really, you know, when we hear people talk about like, man, this workout took me a long time, or I got it done in 60 minutes, or I got it done in 90 minutes. There can be a lot of variability in how long somebody spends in the gym. You know, how much time did you look at your phone? How much time were you chatting with friends how much time were you trying to you know didn't you, you read the thing and you had to read it again because it wasn't it didn't click in your brain like um and so we just try and consider all that stuff uh when i talked about other programming variables about the training you know pillars training program um each day is really going to and i i just spent a lot of time writing about this yesterday but i took kind of 10 what I would call 10 sort of pillars of functional bodybuilding training programs. Um, a pillar would be like a foundational element to what you see 80% of the time in all FBB programs. You know, yeah, periodically I'll throw in, you know, uh, something that is legless rope climbs and running and, you know, it's, it's, it's not like a common uh, conditioning format or skill that we do. But most of the time, you know, what you see in training falls into one of these 10 categories. Examples of those 10 categories would be warm up and cool down, something we call pre fatigue, something we call hot starts, uh, strength balance, positional strength, or interval conditioning. So I think I named six or seven right there, but there's 10. So on any given day of pillars, I'm going to combine four or five of those pillars into a workout, into a workout that touches on a variety of different fitness traits, strength, flexibility, aerobic capacity, and hypertrophy or muscle building. And the idea is that you can, with a well-balanced and designed program, thoughtful, come into the gym and get all of those fitness traits checked off and then you're done. You can leave. And <clears throat> if you train four times a week for 60 minutes with a well-designed program, you can actually achieve a pretty good amount of fitness in all of those categories like that would match most people's goals. Are you going to be a world-class bodybuilder on that? No. Are you going to win any powerlifting meets with that? No. You know, will you go and place first in the uh, Boston Marathon? No. But those are, you know, those are world-class feats that require world-class levels of commitment and training and discipline. And we're talking about the person who's got a shorter amount of time to dedicate to training, but doesn't want to miss out on all of the stuff yeah. and that's that was what we aim for here so um you know i don't want to like pretend like it's perfect and it's going to be like you know it's going to give you everything you ever wanted because then well what's the point of training 90 minutes a day five days a week which is one of our other programs it's like well if you have the extra 30 minutes a day and a fifth day you can go get a little bit more out of your training if you want but if you don't have that I do not want somebody to feel like they're missing out. And I absolutely believe that with this focused training, you can get all of that stuff in a way that's going to make you feel fulfilled and, and working towards your goals. Yeah. And one thing I might add is that with a typical gym program, that's not 
as varied as something like CrossFit or I don't really know what they do in Orange Theory, but that's what I'd imagine. They have some variety there. Sure. You would be able to look at the training template and say, okay, this day is back and chest and this day is leg day, et cetera. And with functional bodybuilding, I think that there is a similar enough theme where you can look at your training ahead if you need to plan out how you're going to mix things up during the week, if you have another sport that you play, if you want to make sure you don't overload any one area. But it's not necessarily going to be the locked-in training template every single time yeah. for, through all eternity. As the cycles change and evolve, that might shift. Yeah, that's a perk that I don't, I don't ever, I don't talk about very much, but you're right. That's like hugely valuable because I hear people, um, you know, a common complaint about the, the group fitness, high, high intensity, varied functional training model is that, gosh, I like never know what to expect. Like, you know, I went in on Monday and my legs were crushed and then Tuesday I had soccer practice or I wanted to go and do like a hike and I was, you know, or, so you don't know what to anticipate or what to expect. Um, there's also the like, man, I went like five days and I never got to even do a, a squat. Like mm -hmm. I did a bunch of other stuff. I did deadlifts, I did presses, I did kettlebell swings and I did burpees, but I just missed the squatting day. And with the way that we pr program our training pr cycles, there is for at, at minimum a period of six weeks, a predictable, repeatable, consistent training timeline and plan where Mondays you can expect you can be you can come to expect certain things and that's a very very powerful training principle that I think got th like kind of got confused for about a decade with uh, a lot of you know a lot of the traditional old school CrossFit methodology programming where it was like constantly varied um, if you were like doing it all the time maybe that was effective but if you were kind of a intermittent periodic you know uh, group fitness uh participant you were missing a lots of good progressive overload and consistency and predictability that would allow you to actually get better yeah. so th that's that is inherent in in all of our programs and in particular you know pillars great okay okay well when i look through these questions in uh the AMA, there were so many about carbs. So, so many people want to know about carbs. Carbs, and yeah. Why are you eating carbs? Well, what do, do you, you eat, eat carbs? Do you not eat carbs? What kind of carbs? How do you know what you need? And and I think that it would be good to address how you think about changing up your approach to a particular macronutrient in your overall balance. <sighs> that was me beating my chest. <laughs> okay getting hyped for this response okay, he's okay. So ready. Whew. here we go okay um <clears throat> there is uh yeah let's talk about this from a number of different angles here all right first and foremost before we have a conversation about carbs which is one of the three macronutrients um i start all my nutrition not with macros in mind i start with is this a you know how how close how closely does this food that i'm about to eat mimic or resemble like a real food and a real food is something that will uh was alive at one point and now that it's dead it's going to rot soon that's it okay it's like okay. oh this thing was alive this is like a cauliflower cracker okay it was alive but now that it's been put into this cracker form and it's got preservatives in it, it's not going to rot. That cracker will be in my in my cupboard for the next 10 months and, you know, it'll be a little stale, but it's not going to go bad. I can still eat it. So that doesn't qualify. So we start with quality of food and we start with it being, you know, it was alive, now it's dead, and it's going to, you know, start to decompose and rot and not be edible because other things, other living things want to eat it too, bacteria, fungus, yeast, all that. <clears throat> okay, now we're on to, so that's got to be the foundation. Next up, it's, um, you know, getting adequate protein is a, is, a, is, a, is a challenge for people. Not me. 
I've been eating lots. I've been eating high protein since I was like fetus, basically. <laughs> okay. I've been on that gains train for a long time. <laughs> no, but seriously, early on, I kind of got like, oh, this, I eat a lot of protein. And my, my challenge has been to like titrate my protein back. I've always overeaten protein beyond what my, my, my physical output requires. It's impressive. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I think it's been a part of my success in a lot of ways, but you know, I've never been like under proteined. Yeah. You know, that's not a thing for that's me. Not you. It's a thing for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but I like to, I, that's because of my focus on, it's like, that's the number one, you know, macro that I think about. I just want to make sure that that rounds out my meals. Plus when you eat a lot of calories, which I do relative to most people, you know, like your protein can go above, you know, what requirements are because you need calories from places. So without trying to like manipulate my meals so much to just keep my protein here and just to like add other things, you know, I'll add more meat that adds more protein, but protein always stays pretty consistent for me. And that's because protein's not a great energy source. It's a really valuable, uh, f uh, food and, and substrate in the body because it provides amino acids, which then turn into functional proteins in the body. That could be enzymes. It could be muscle tissue. It could be other parts of connective tissue, cell membranes, things like that. We need it, you know, to do things that matter, but beyond a certain point, it's really not necessary. And it could potentially be problematic to, you know, overeat and over consume because it doesn't really add, it, it's harder to digest. Um, it, it doesn't convert well, um, could be energetically costly. I don't know. There's, there's a number of reasons why it might not be ideal to like go way over your, you know, requirements for protein. So once protein is set, then we've got carbs and fat. Now carbs are, uh, th that's the question. How many carbs do you need? Right. And this is like a, a really debated topic. And it's like, well, if you're doing sports, you need a lot of carbs. And if you don't do sports, maybe you don't need as many carbs. And you know, what is the daily, uh, the, the daily like requirement for human for carbs? You know the answer to this? I'm trying to play out all of the nutrition knowledge in my mind. I mean, I know that people are in ketosis and they're perfectly successful. Yeah. Getting through the day. <laughs> right. So <laughs> so if you actually like, um, you know, I'm not talking about like what's the, you know, FDA say you need like yeah. recommended a, a daily, you know, allowance or whatever of carbs. It You're physically, we don't actually need carbs. Like you could remove that entire category of macronutrient and you could thrive not true for protein mm -hmm. and not true for fat right you can't you die you get real sick mm -hmm. but carbs take them out you can actually be extremely healthy vibrant like person now most people are going to say like that's crazy like you can't it's like not sustainable it's like <laughs> okay but there were, there were groups of individuals, whole populations that survived, not to survive, but that's, they just, that's how they thrive. That's how they lived. Yeah. It wasn't, they weren't like, damn, I need a carb. They were just like, <laughs> that was just, they're just like, oh, there's a whale, there's blubber, <laughs> boom, we're, we're good. I'm fucking winning, you know? They weren't like, dude, I miss my cookies. Like, it just, <laughs> it's not a thing, okay? So anyway, all is that, that's all only to say like, I don't. Need, we don't need them now now between the spectrum of like we don't need them to like holy smokes have you been to the bouchon bakery like you do <laughs> need to have carbs. you need that <laughs> you, need, you need that okay like how, how are you gonna live how do you want to live and there's a whole movement you know that was really kind of started by charles Polican, which was like you gotta like earn your carbs there's like a whole earning your carbs, which I think is also problematic because I don't want anybody to think they need to like earn the right to eat food. Yes. Like, and somebody called me out on this on social media and I was like, I'm totally on board with that. Like, I don't want my daughters to ever hear the concept of like, you got to earn those carbs. You know, it's like eat what, eat what's what you need. But if I can dive into where that comes from, 
you know, your body uses carbohydrates uh, preferentially when they're around, okay? You know, there are certain types of metabolism in the body that can j utilize carbohydrates for fuel very efficiently and effectively. Um, in the absence of carbs, when you don't eat them, your body makes them in your body. Like, your, your body makes them in your body. In your body. We have a, yeah, in your body, your body's making them <laughs> in the body. But if you go in, outside the body, the body can't make them. <laughs> Can't make them out there. You can't make your body can't make them across the street. It makes them here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay. <laughs> it's called gluconeogenesis. Oh, it's damn. making of glucose. So you can make some because, like, in your muscle tissue, you want to have glucose available for anaerobic metabolism, which is like sprinting. So you want to have a little bit of stores of glucose in your muscles. So if you're not eating carbs, guess what? Your body's going to make it from fat or from protein. It's going to store it in your muscles so that when you need to sprint, you can sprint. All right. Um, your brain likes to fuel off of glucose or ketones. Interchangeable. It can do both. Um, so again, if I'm doing a certain type of training or if I have a certain type of like need in my life, like I train hard, I lift weights, like okay, I do something very physical, like that could benefit from having some carbs. How much? That's the big debate. It's like, how many carbs do you need, you know, to like play your sport or to lift weights? I think there's a misconception where it's like, okay, I need 500 grams of carbs to be a weightlifter. It's like, no, you don't need that, you know, but how do we put a number on that? When I was training in the sport of CrossFit, a lot of the training was highly glycolytic, meaning it used glucose to fuel it. A lot of anaerobic metabolism, a lot of lactic acid producing, you know, training. I was using carbs for that. So I needed a certain amount of carbs for my training. Also, carbohydrates were a tool to like impact my hormones and impact my um cortisol levels and my recovery and basically provide really easy to digest calories so people were i was manipulating carbohydrates a lot in the crossfit sport upwards of like five six hundred grams a day which is a massive amount of sugar and it was it was there to help me with my performance because that's all i cared about there are drawbacks to having that much sugar from inflammation to uh you know, things that are going to impact potentially your health long term. And if you're not training that much, eating that much sugar is highly problematic to your pancreas, to uh, insulin sensitivity, diabetes, heart health, like all kinds of problems that can come from it. So I see that as like this area to like really be mindful of like, what do you need it for? Like right now I train because I like the movement. I like to, I'm not training to win the sport. So I'm not going to push my carbohydrates to five, 600 grams because that's not my goal anymore. And at this point, like th there's drawbacks to having that much sugar coursing through my veins all, you know, the time. Like I was drinking like 300 grams of basically soda, mm -hmm. a sugar soda. You know, yeah, it was called Gatorade or it was called whatever. It was like yeah. recovery powders, but it's sugar. It's just soda. And that's totally not necessary now. So I titrate that way back. I do that through and I say, okay, well, I'm going to get my food and my carbs from things that were alive. Now they're dead and they're going to rot. So that's vegetables, some fruit, and periodically some like starchy potatoes, but not that much. Cause I'm like, okay, I can, I need to, f I'm functioning around, you know, 200 grams of carbs a day, which somebody might hear me like, that's a lot. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's not nothing mm -hmm. but i'm just getting it from vegetables and i'm getting it from fruits and berries and you know potatoes here and there and yeah occasionally i'm like i want to have you know pizza okay i'm gonna have that but most days i'm not so the carbohydrates come down and then people are like whoa you're eating a lot of fat i'm like well i'm eating as much fat as i need to meet my full daily requirement of energy right how do i know how much energy i need well I've tracked it. I'm like, you know, I'm not, my weight's not going up. It's not going down. I need some calories to fuel me. Like this is how many calories I need to kind of maintain. I like have my daily, you know, 
caloric expenditure is kind of estimated out pretty accurately through tracking it for a period of time. And if I'm getting this much protein and I'm getting this much carbs because I'm opti- my, I'm trying to like, you know, stick to moderate lower amounts of carbs and just relative to what I need to like perform my physical functions, then guess what? The rest of my energy is going to come from fat because my body is burning that as, as energy. Like I'm not just storing all this extra fat that I'm putting into my body. My body knows how to use it as a fuel source. And so then the last question I get is, aren't you worried about all that cholesterol that you're eating? Yeah. And this is like, am I concerned about my heart health? I think is the underlying question to, aren't you worried about all that? Because the consumption of, of fat and cholesterol has been uh, incorrectly uh, con- connected to cardiovascular disease for the last several decades. And um, so where, and I'll try and keep this as, you know, without going too deep into this, but um, cardiovascular risk factors from diet um, are going to be negatively impacted by high sugar consumption, high inflammatory states in the body, and uh, fatty acid consumption that is also pro-inflammatory so lots of omega-6 fatty acids in your diet which are very that that are inflammatory and so if those three factors are combined then you have a real problem so if you're eating a ton of sugar which i am not if you're eating a ton of refined vegetable oils which have high in omega-6 fatty acids and are very unstable Plus, you have a lot of stress, which is creates a ton of inflammation in the body. Mm. Though, and also stress from poor quality foods and grains and things that actually cause uh, GI disturbances leading to leaky gut and then inflammatory markers in your blood. Those three things are going to create a, a major problem. So then I would be concerned about how much f- fat you're eating along with the sugar. But in the case of consumption of cholesterol and animal fats, animal fats from pastured meat that was like, that was fed a diet of grass, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and be like, well, that's really healthy for you because people can say all they, they can, they can twist those words. What I will say is that you need fatty acids that are saturated saturated fatty acids and cholesterol to thrive and to live your best life why because this is a vital makeup of your body when i said that there are no uh like essential carbohydrates cholesterol and saturated fats are essential fats for your life if you don't have them you will have weak weak tissues you will not heal. Your cell membranes will be fragile and not very strong and robust. Your brain, the composition of your actual brain cells and tissue is highly, highly dense with fats and cholesterols. Your hormones, the sex hormones, androgens in your bodies, those are derived from cholesterol precursors. We cannot make that. We must consume it from the diet. Um, so with those things considered, then I have to, it has to be clear that this is not like, it's not like a, oh, it's bad for your heart or it's good for your heart. It's like, what about my, what about my healing? What about my hormones? What about my brain? What about my cognitive function? Uh, what what about all the other things that require cholesterol and saturated fatty acids? So my carbohydrates are moderate. I'm not keto. I, I haven't tested my blood, but you know most smart people that do keto research and the common knowledge out there is that if you're really eating more than 50 to like 75 net carbohydrates a day, you won't go into ketosis. Your body will just, it will shut down that process and utilize, you know, the carbohydrates and just keep the ketogenic process off the table. 
that doesn't mean you can't burn fat. Like I'm still oxidizing fat every day as a fuel source. I'm just not converting it into ketones to go to my brain to feed my brain. Mm -hmm. I, I have enough glucose carbohydrates to feed my brain each day. So I'm not in ketosis. I'm just eating a lower carb, higher fat, moderate protein diet, which looks like meat, vegetables, some fruit, nut and seeds, some oils, avocado, and a little bit of starch here and there. And that's it. And it's, it looks different. Like when it's depicted on my plate, well, when you see someone that's eating 4,000 calories, guess what? I got to add a lot more of the stuff that people usually don't add to their plate. But if you have a salad with a little bit of chicken on it, and if you have two, three eggs in the morning with a little bit of avocado and some spinach, and you have, you know, a dinner of roasted vegetables and a piece of salmon, that's, that's what I'm doing. That, and no one's looking at that like, whoa, that's like a, it's crazy. They're like, oh, that would be a pretty healthy diet, I think. Mm. You know, vegetables and meat and, yeah. yeah. No one's saying like, oh, you're keto? No, that's, that's mesh, meat, meat and vegetables. Yeah. It's, it's paleo-ish. Ish. Yeah. You've mentioned, <sighs> good job. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was solid. I have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned titrating nutrients a couple times today, and mm -hmm. maybe it would be helpful to talk about what that is and why you don't just make a big dramatic change to the number of macros you take in. Great question, yeah. First off, titrating is like a geeky word that I think it's like kind of lingers from my years in you know, college where we're in molecular cell biology doing the, the chem experiments, and it's like, you know, Everyone that did like intro chemistry or chemistry, there was always like the experiment where you were like, you were trying to like get something to, I don't know, suspend out of solution. And you like, you had the little like pipette and you had to like let one drop go at a time, one drop. And there was like a, it was like between 27 and 28 drops, like the whole magic happened. Yeah. And if you went too fast or if you went too, like if you know, you never see it. You're like, uh, teacher, this isn't working. It's like, because you went too fast, you know? <laughs> you got to titrate slowly. That's titration. It's, uh, yeah, it's this concept of like, you know, you're going to, you want to like see what changes are happening. You got to go freaking slow. You can't go fast. And that's important with nutrition, but it's so hard to do. It's so hard to do because I think the modern perception of like, food quantities and serving sizes is totally uh you know grossly over <laughs> overestimated mm. it's like okay you want to like add a you know you you want to see how your diet or how what would happen to your body if you changed your calories a little bit it's like add a half a teaspoon of peanut butter today for the next week and it's like, what? Half a, t what? You know, like a half a tablespoon or something like that. Like, yeah, that's like 60 calories. Like you just added 60 calories a day, which is 5% of your whole diet. It's like, oh, whoa. Like I'm making small changes to see what happens, you know? And so like that was an experiment I kind of played with like a few months ago. I was like, I need to, I'm feeling like undernourished. I was talking about this with the added cardio I was doing. I'm like, I got to add a little bit. Mm -hmm. I didn't just add another meal each day. I was like, I'm going to add 100 calories a day. I did that for a week, and then I'm going to add another 100 calories. And like, what is 100 calories? Well, it's like a, it's like a small apple, or it's one tablespoon of almond butter, or mm. it's, you know, half a tablespoon of this, and it's, you know, two ounces of the meat, or it's, you know, it's it's these precise amounts that are not that big. You know, and so I don't, I don't just make these big swings because I want to, I want to see like, okay, how's, how's this impacting my body and, you know, small changes viewed over a period of time allows me to make those, you know, judgments. Now, not everyone is trying to make these like, you know, types of changes and we don't need to get that detailed about, you know, making small changes, but I think it's important to just hear that small changes can be profound if they're implemented and repeated for days at a time or weeks at a time. Um, anyway, I hope that answered the question. Yeah. I think that's an unusual perspective that 
a typical person might not have on nutrition because I think people tend to want a big change and so they want to do a lot right away to like jumpstart that. Yeah. 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 And I think another part of the part of the thinking there is that, you know, jump starting things and doing big changes, yeah, it it, it certainly can be effective. Mm-hmm. It can. But it it doesn't give your it doesn't give you a chance to like kind of catch up with the feeling that goes with it, right? You jump into something, whoa, that was intense, like, oh my gosh, it's making this big change and then <gasps> It's overwhelming. I can't do it anymore, right? Whereas these kind of slow changes and flows, like your body can adapt and adjust and you can start to feel like, oh, this is what it feels like. This feels good. Or I like this feeling. Or, you know, you don't, you don't overwhelm your senses. You don't overwhelm your sense of like your, how you feel in your body when you make uh, small, smaller, when you titrate slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because we all have our daily balance that's sort of our equilibrium point of our combined factors of energy and sleep and what we typically do in a day. And yeah. so, yeah, it's important to stay attuned to that. Yep. Yeah. It's like eating the whole gummy versus eating like, you know, yeah. a quarter of it. Just a little. little just, just get a little nibble. A little nib. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think we have a, another short one to wrap this one up. I think I've gone, I went deep on, on one and we chewed up a lot of time yeah we're just gonna do one little quick dessert question Uh uh-huh do you never crave sweets or treats dude who the (laughs) hell do you think i am not some robot (laughs) i can't turn that switch off i love when people say like i'm just not a sweets person i'm like i get it like you might crave something else but like if it's, if you taste it, if it's in your, you know, if it gets in there. If it's in there. <laughs> you ready to get Ain't some. Ain't no one kicking that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, craving to me happens when I'm undernourished. Yeah. When I don't eat enough. Like that's when I get the craving, you know. Um, when I'm well fed, I rarely crave things, but... When I'm around it, I'm like, oh, that looks like a, you know, last weekend we were at a a kid's birthday party and the parents crushed it. They Mm -hmm. had the best food spread and things that I've like, I was like, this is, this is not like a kid's party with like little bags of goldfish. This is like, you know, rustic bakery, like fresh loaves and like charcuterie board. Oh man, it was was nuts. And they had a, um, they got a cake from this place in the city which was like, you know, pro cake. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's peanut butter Nutella flavor. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I'm glad I ate before I came, but damn, that looks good. You know, like I, I was in, I was, I didn't eat any, but, um, but I was tempted for sure. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, I, I, I get a little, I get tempted and I do have sweets from time to time. And, but the craving part and then the overindulgence part happens when I'm under, when I'm underfed yeah, and there, therefore the low calorie, try and cut calories always and live in the diet culture life. I think that is w- one of the reasons it fails so much is because you will be tempted by something. And when you're in a caloric deficit, the willpower that you have will not, uh, will not win against your biology. Right. Your biology is stronger than your willpower because it had to be in order for us to be here today. So when you're underfed, low caloried, diet coked up, and then somebody at the birthday party plops the Nutella peanut butter cake in front of you, you will not win. <laughs> cake cake wins. It's cake, time. cake one, willpower zero. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.